and bam. All right, let's go back. All right, here we go. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, I'm just gonna go over the consolidated plan and some of the information on the community development block grant, some of the history on there. Um, <clears throat> basically, I'm gonna cover the consolidated plan and annual action plan, fast facts about the CDBG program, federal regulations governing the CDBG program, and uh, some of the proposed activity requirements. All right, let's talk about the consolidated plan. Uh, the consolidated plan and annual action plan guys are uh, consolidated plan funded. It's a five year strategy and annual action plan. Now HUD must review and approve these plans before the city of Detroit receives funds and before any recipients spend any funds. So now since uh, Tamara was, was saying that we're sh we should be in the second year of the annual action plan and I'll kind of uh, explain some of that going forward. Um, we're in the 2021-2022, uh, which would be the sec second year. And uh, because of the pandemic, we still have to submit our uh, consolidated plan, our five-year plan, and our first year of action an annual action plan. Now, the consolidated plan is a five-year strategy, analyzes existing conditions that identify and prioritizes the following needs. It uh, talks about the affordable housing needs. It should have the community development needs and needs of vulnerable persons and family. As a jurisdiction that receives funding directly from HUD, the city of Detroit is required to develop a consolidated plan to inform its use of the four annual HUD programs, which are the Community Development Block Grant, Home Investment Partnership, Emergency Solution Grant, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. And we plan on submitting our five-year plan by October 15th of 2020. The Annual Action Plan. It acts as the city's application to HUD to receive annual consolidated plan program fund. It implements the st strategies, goals, and objectives of the consolidated plan. Again, the city of Detroit plans on submitting the 2020-2021 action plan uh, by May uh, 15, I think that's a typo. So uh, the 2000, it should be 2021-2021. 22 uh, action plan by May 15, 2021. All right, so basically what I was trying to explain, here's a chart, is a nice chart that shows the five-year plan goes from 2020 to 2024. And within that action uh, five-year plan, you have the year one, which is 2020, when we plan on submitting that again, October 15, 2020 of this year. And then the next year, which we're uh, doing the CDBG NOF proposals for the year two, which we are planning on sending that, submitting that in May 15 of 2021. As you can see, and then we'll be in year three next year, year four, and year five, and so on. Let's talk about the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG. It's a federal program operated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD. It provides entitlement grants to local entities for community development activities. And you can always look up the regulations in 24 CFR Part 570. Uh, the program objective is to develop viable communities by providing decent housing, suitable living environments, and expanding economic opportunity, principally for low and moderate income persons. And the key word is low, moderate income person. So um, in order for you to qualify, you have to benefit low and moderate income person. The grant amount is determined by a formula and varies from year to year according to the amount appropriate nationally by the U.S. Congress. As you can see, I'll show you some charts where the formula that we receive annually varies. Here's some of the fast facts of the CDBG program. It was authorized under Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 by President Gerald Ford. Allocations are made to states, urban counties, and entitled local governments based on a formula devised by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. At one time, it was funded at $3 billion in 2017. Uh, the current year, 
2020-2021 CDB allocation to the city of Detroit is 35 million 285 455. This was an increase from the previous year of a difference of 769,122. So we got an increase from uh, last year. And I'll show you the amount. So here's the uh, history of what we normally get over back in 2005, we were over 41 million. Uh, <clears throat> and as you can see, 2020, 2021, we're probably at about the 35 million mark. Uh, the federal regulation. So if you wanna look up the federal regulation, if you can't sleep at night and having a hard time, especially in this pandemic, you can always Google these regulations, um, and uh, I'm sure they probably put you right to sleep. So you can go to the Code of Federal Regula Regulations, Title 24, Part 570. You put that in Google, and you can read all the regulations. And let's talk about how we pass a uh, to see if your your um, program is eligible. You have to pass a two prong test. Again, it must demonstrate compliance with a national objective and it has to be an eligible activity. In compliance with the national objective, there are three of them. It must benefit low and moderate income person. Uh, the other national objective that we probably won't get into is it, uh, is it must prevent or eliminate slums and blight, and uh, it must meet urgent need. Now, examples of urgent need is we have a catastrophe, some similar to the pandemic, and we did use it, uh, <clears throat> we could use uh, funding for urgent needs. However, 70% uh, of all your CDBG funds must meet a no mod national objective. Let's talk about the low mod. So low mod has a subcategory, two main subcategories is limited clientele activity. So 51% of your persons benefiting from your activity must be a low mod. Um, and then the other one is low mod area. So 51% in that area uh, residing in the service area must be a low moderate income. So, but most of you all as a public service activity will use the limited clientele activity. Again, some of the public service eligible activities you can go to CFR, CFR uh, 570, um, although that we're doing public service for CDBG NOF. There's other eligible activities that we do um, under our budget. We do have some public facility rehab, public service homeless, economic development, and single family home repair. These are some of them, not all. Now, you can look up some matrix codes. So some of you all qualify under these activities. As you can see, there's a string of them um, from A, and I think this list, uh, they, I think it gets even further this current year. Uh, but as you can see, if you're doing senior service activity, that would be under the matrix code 05A. If you're doing youth services, that would be under the matrix code 05D. So these are some, of, these are the activities that you could do a public service program under and their matrix code. Now, here's, uh, we have in our community virtual meeting uh, for districts three and four, so save the date. If you guys wanna jump in on this Zoom, this will give you some more information about ComPlan and our neighborhood revitalization strategy area, our NERSA, we reached um, doing the boundaries. So if you wanna jump on, um, you can come on uh, August 25th, and this information will be on the website, and I believe we're gonna save some of these slides to be available as well. So you can always jump on. Um, uh, we're gonna do a really quick one on Tuesday, August 25th from 6 to 6.30, and then we'll do a, uh, a for the other districts, and you can go on any, any one, and then we'll do a, a more detailed version, um, our second meeting, which would be, uh, I think that's a typo. Actually, it's September 2nd, uh, 2020. So uh, I will fix this before we send this out. It will be uh, September 2nd, 2020, and that will be from 6 to 7 p.m. 
And this is the outline of what we're going to talk about. We're going to get, go over the overview of the consolidated annual action plan, including funding allocations, similar to what I just gave you. However, we're going to give the uh, information we did send out surveys. So we're going to have the results of the surveys that we sent out, and then we'll have the NURSA pass accomplishment and the NURSA renewal of the new boundary areas. And this concludes my area. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tamara and she's gonna take you further. Awesome, thank you, Warren. Um, I just wanna reiterate, a lot, I get the questions all the time around our action plan and when there, we're gonna be having meetings regarding the consolidated plan. So please, any of you who are interested in being a part of that conversation and giving your feedback. We always hear that there's no opportunity to provide feedback as it's related to the annual action plan. Um, but they, the city of Detroit is giving you an opportunity to provide your feedback. So please take those dates down, make sure that you are a part of that webinar so that you can get your questions answered. I'm just going to go ahead and move into my portion of the webinar. Gordon, if you can cue up the slides for me, that would be wonderful. And again, if you have questions, we are going to give you an opportunity to answer, ask those questions, but please hold them till the end. So as you know, this is our 21-22 application workshop. How many of you by raise of hand, and I think we can do this, right, Gordon? How many of you have ever applied for the NOF application before? By a raise of hand, let me know just how many of you have because that lets me know who I'm talking to and how, I, how, much, um, how much detail I want to provide for this particular workshop. We're up about 21 individuals. Okay, it's still moving. I'm gonna give you a chance to raise that hand. So right now I see it's about, wow, um, maybe close to a quarter of you so far. So great, that's, that's good to know how many of you have actually done this before. But that tells me also that quite a few of you have not. So that's, that gives me a little information. Gordon, if you wanna go to our next slide, please. So. Here's an agenda for you today of what we're going to do. We, I welcomed you in. We, uh, Warren talked about the consolidated plan strategy and the annual action plan. And I'm going to present to you information on our public service eligibility in our application, uh, along with Gordon. And then we're going to talk about our Oracle advanced procurement and then answer questions. So that gives you an idea of where we're going. Next slide, please. So, here is our team. Uh, many of you know Kerry Batinger. He's been with the city of Detroit for well over 20 years in a number of capacities. And he is very skilled and knowledgeable about CDBG and all things public service. You met Gordon Pearson again, and we have a new individual coming on, Andrew Gaines. Welcome, Andrew. I believe he's also on the line. Uh, he'll be starting with us next week. We offered him an uh, opportunity to just get online and get a taste of some of the work that we do right now. But Andrew is going to be coming on and he is going to focus on our um, CARES Act funding. So as you know, we are doing a lot of uh, um, programming around the CARES Act, making sure you have your, the needs are being met, particularly for our seniors, and he's going to help with that program. And then there's Mandy Valentine who's on as well. And myself, go ahead, Gordon. So what's our purpose? Well, our purpose for today is to provide a, organizations with a better understanding of CDBG NOF application process and to provide organizations that would be you with the tools to submit the best application possible. We do this every year, twice a year, and we also host other um, webinars and workshops so that you can, we can provide you with the tools that you need to provide that application and do your very best. It is a very competitive application. We recognize this. There's not a lot of funding. As you heard, our funding has decreased over time. So we wanna make sure that everyone has an equal footing in applying and submitting the best application. Our vision is to improve the social condition of low income residents in the city of Detroit. Our program really does speak to the social determinants of health. I recognize that's a public, that's more of a uh, public health 
uh, application or wording, but it really does go to addressing any type of social conditions that the city of Detroit residents might face and to making those conditions better so that you can live a better life and have better opportunities to go further in the things that you want to do. Um, that's our goal is to build the capacity of public service organizations to offer those programs and services to you um, in our CDBG programming. So that's what we're here for. That's what we strive to do. And we're always working to be better at what we do. We're not perfect. None of us have walked on water, but we're striving to do better and to be better for the citizens of Detroit. Next, Gordon. What won't we do? This is just as important. So I always lose people when I say this, but we ha it has to be said. It has to be said. Um, if you are here, anyone who's on this webinar and you want to get questions related to your specific application, we're not here to do that. We're not going to answer any questions re relative to what you should put on your application. We recognize that you are skilled in the work that you do and you are best suited to answer your own questions. So we ask that you read the question and you answer to the best of your ability. Make sure you answer it thoroughly, but we can't answer the question for you. We can't tell you how to do your work. Um, we're not here to answer any questions related to public facility rehab grants. If you're here for that, we do know that Lindsay Wallace is the director of that program. And I know that they're going to be submitting a RFP soon but you can certainly reach out to Lindsay Wallace with the City of Detroit and she can answer your questions. Homeless Solution Grants and Housing Rehab Grants. We are not here for that either. So if you have any questions related to the Homeless Solution Grants, we ask that you re reach out to Tara Linzer. She is over that program. She manages and directs that program. And for Housing Rehab Grants, we ask that you reach out to the City of Detroit Housing and Revitalization Department and they can provide you with any questions you might have or answer any questions, I should say, you may have related to those individual programs. Next. What this workshop will cover. What we will cover is anything related to 21-22 CDBG Neighborhood Opportunity Fund grants. So if you're here for that, you are definitely in the right place. Gordon, keep on, move on. So let's get into our overview and eligibility. Um, this is going to be very important. So those of you who have never applied, please listen closely. What is it? As Warren said, this program has been operating since 1976 through our city council. Um, the NOF program is a CDBG block grant program, and we are here to provide public services to improve the social condition of low-income residents in the city of Detroit. Warren did a very good job in going thoroughly over CDBG, so I'm not going to rehash that and go back into detail over that. You can continue, Gordon. So here again, Gordon, uh, I believe that Warren talked about 24 CFR 570.200. You can go on the HUB website, H-U-D. You can even type in 24 CFR 570.201 on your um, internet and it will bring up all the regulations and give you a thorough um, review of what the CDBG Public Service Program is. As Warren said, it is exciting reading, psych, but what it will do is uh, we get a lot of questions on what does public service fund. If you're interested in what uh, public service fund, you can go to this website and they'll give you all the information you need. As it relates to low mod income criteria, you can go on CUT's website as well, and it'll give you all that information as well. So I'm not going to go deep into that. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. So what do we fund? What has City Council said? These are the important areas that we want you to fund. Um, these are all on the HUD website, but one is education, two, public safety, three, health, youth recreation, and five, seniors. These are all the areas that we provide funding in. And um, again, education relates to literacy, and you'll see this at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of the slide, it might not be as clear. So I'm just gonna go into it a little bit more. That will be um, education includes literacy, enrichment, reading, readiness, math, science, and job training. Public safety includes community neighborhood-based 
uh, domestic and gun violence, anything that has to do with safety in your community. Health includes health services to low mod individuals. Youth recre recreation includes arts and sports, and seniors includes transportation and health services. Next, Gordon. So, our threshold criteria, the one thing that I would have those of you to know and understand, please listen. In order to qualify for CDBG NOF funding, you must meet all of the threshold criteria. Not some, not one out of two, not one out of 10. You have to meet all of them. If you fail to meet one, you fail to meet them all. So what are they? Number one, you must meet all the HUD national objectives. That means you have to benefit low mode income individuals. Your program does. You have to prevent or eliminate lum or slight or blight of some type. And you have to meet an unneed, uh, urgent need. So somewhere in your program, you have to meet those national HUD objectives. Excuse me. Your board, you have to have a board. And you have to have at least five members on your board, which meet at least biannually. And you have to be able to show and prove that you've met biannually. We will ask for information on your application that you will need to submit to us, showing and proving that you've met over the course of the year. You have to be able to show that you at least attended or viewed one of the workshops. If you're on right now, you've met that criteria. You must be a nonprofit organization and be able to prove that you have 501c3 or 501c19 status at the time of application. Um, there is no way around that. You should be able to show us your federal exempt status. Number four, oh, that was four. Number five, you must complete the application in its entirety. If you complete some of it, but not all of it, you will not qualify for this program. You have to be able to show us operating proof. Um, and that comes in the form of um, a bank statement. And it has to be in the organization's name, not your own personal name. If you send us a bank report with your name on it, from your personal bank account, you will not qualify. You have to be able to show us at least two years and be able to prove that you've been in operation for at least two years. Gordon, next. Mm. You also must be able to show and prove that you don't have any unresolved government audits or monitoring issues. You can show that many ways, but um, we will get a copy of your audit report. If you don't have an audit because your organization is small, you've never done an audit, all we ask is that you submit your statements, of finance, your financial statements. Um, you must sign and read all of the certification forms that are included in the application, and you must submit them. If they are not signed, guess what? You do not meet criteria. Your current financial statements, as I said before, you must submit them. If you don't have an audit, we will accept your cash flow statements and your financial statements. Um, your Michigan annual nonprofit status. This is one that trips everyone up. Every single year, we have individuals who submit the application, submit all the documentation, but they, sub they miss submitting their annual profit report. Your Michigan annual profit report is not your annual report from your organization. It is a report you get from the federal government, from your state government, excuse me. I've given you on this slide where you need to go to get that. It has to be done yearly. So if you are a nonprofit, this is something that you are required to do yearly. Um, so if you haven't done it, I suggest you go online and do it now. Articles of Incorporation. If you are a 501c3 organization, you should have a certificate of good standing in articles of incorporation for your organization. And then finally, 7% operating cash. Because we are a reimbursement grant, we ask that you have at least 7% of what you're asking for in the bank. Because we are reimbursement, you submit, you pay for whatever you're doing, and then you submit your 
receipts to us, and then we reimburse you for them. So if you don't have that money available, how do you pay for your services up front? It's important that you have cash on hand to do that. And you be able to prove that you have that cash on hand. So if you're asking for a $100,000 grant, we expect to see 7% of $100,000 in your bank account at the time of your application. Not five days later, not 30 days later, not at the time we go before council for de deliberation, but at the time of application. Gordon? I just wanted to note that um, the Michigan Annual Nonprofit Report, uh, that it, it should be, it should read the 19 uh, and 2020. So that needs to be, it will be updated. For this exactly. upcoming application, it needs to be a 1920 or a 2020. Michigan Thank Annual you, Gordon, for reiterating that. Yes, if you submit 1617, 1718, or 1819, then you're ineligible. You should have a 1920 and you should be applying for 2021. You can go to the website that's on the screen, www.michigan.gov slash Lara, L-A-R-A, and apply and update your Michigan Annual Nonprofit Report. I see that Lynette Simmons has her hand raised. Lynette, if you would give me an opportunity to finish out my portion, I'll allow you to answer your question. Gordon, can you go to the next slide, please? So here's our eligibility criteria. Again, um, in order to qualify for this funding, you must submit your annual bylaws, a constitution and employee handbook. All of those have to be submitted. You have to have a federal tax identification and a DUNS number, a current DUNS number. You have to have a board of trustees roster and that must be submitted with the application. Again, your financial audits covering the past two years, um, unaudited year in financial statements if you're not audited, your most recent IRS form 990 if applicable. You must be able to show that you've been in operation for at least two years or continue. You must be able to demonstrate that this is important because we have a lot of organizations that have been applying for this grant and have received it over the years. If in order to continue to receive funding, you have to be able to show a quantifiable increase in the work you're doing. If you've been getting this grant for the last five years and you're doing the same thing for the same population and you've not done anything to increase the work that you're doing to advance in the community, then that's not a quantifiable increase. If you can't show that you've added on a new program, that's not a quantifiable increase. If you can't show that you have individuals who are in a waiting to get into your program, that's not a quantifiable increase. If you're serving the same 12 people you've been serving for the last 10 years, that's not a quantifiable increase. We are looking for organizations that are increasing their capacity to serve more individuals in the city of Detroit. Um, demonstrate compliance with contractual obligations. For those organizations that have been with us for the last five years, 10 years, and have been receiving this grant, you already know, if you don't follow your contractual obligations, you will not be able to continue in this program. You will not receive, you will receive um, um, subtraction of the number of points that you receive in your application if you're not following. And we do keep track of that. That's something you need to know. We are um, monitoring yearly those organizations that are part of this program. If you're not number one, uh, um, uh, making sure that you are complying with the contractual obligations, then we will note that in the points that you receive on this application. Number two, if you're not um, uh, meeting the goals that you set for your own organization, then we are keeping track of that. We want to know why you're not meeting those goals, why you're not serving your, the public, why the, the, your measurable outcomes are not being met. That has a direct impact on whether you will continue to receive these fundings. Um, program activities. Again, have you achieved the stated objectives and maximized impacts and outcomes in the community and to the people that you're serving? Very important. And all applicants must submit with the proposal current and complete program performance data for the past two years. Gordon, next. J.J. Jones, love, I see your hand is raised. We will get to your questions shortly. So 
here are a list of ineligible activities. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I would uh, ask that you, when you get the application, make sure you read through these and make sure you understand what can and cannot be, um, what is and is not eligible for this program. Pre-contract costs, no. Back taxes, we're not going to pay your back taxes, all right? We're not going to do it, so don't ask. Excessive travel expense. Um, if it's re travel and meetings, if it's related to the program that you are running and it's reasonable, we will look into that and give you, but that's on the, you know, we have to de define and decide on that at the time of your program. Improperly procured purchases, undocumented mileage, gifts and donations. You cannot use our funding for gifts and, and donations. Uh, many times we will get an application that says they want to offer stipends. We cannot provide stipends with this program. We cannot provide gift cards. So you want to make sure that if that's something that's part of your program, it must come out of your own program budget, not out of our. It must come out of your operational budget, not out of the, out of the program budget. Staff recruitment, no. Facilities equipment depreciation, no. Um, again, many of these, I'm just going to skip down to the bottom. If you are suing the city of Detroit, no. If you are suing us, don't ask for money from us. <laughs> you know, so if you're lobbying, no. Rental assistance for, you know, no. It depends on the program. So those, some of these things are based on the program that you're operating. Payments for bad debts, no. So uh, Gordon, again, read through, I, I urge you to please read the application before applying. It is very important that you do that. We ask that everyone who is applying for this program, that you come in at, with at least a $100,000 ask. While we don't always fund at that level, it is important that we um, minimize, or HUD has asked that we reduce the number of applications so that we can increase the number of dollars so that you can uh, provide more support in the communities. So in past times, I believe this program probably offered $40,000 grants, $30,000 grants, $20,000 grants, not anymore. Um, we have reduced the number of applicants so that we can provide more dollars to the um, program so that you can do greater work in the communities that you serve. So that's what we ask for it next. So this ends my portion of the program. Um, Mandy, if you'd like, you can open it up for questions and I'll take a, a, up to five questions. That's it. So uh -huh. we can. Okay, Jacqueline Jones Love. Um, Jacqueline, it, you might be on mute. Take yourself off mute if you're on mute. Mandy, go to the next person, please. Kelly B. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you yes, great. Yes, we can. Hi, guys. I just had a question about, um, so like when it said you can't do promotions, but then it say that you're supposed to make sure you get the word out about um, the uh, services you offer, but you can't tell, but you won't pay for it. No, no. What, what that means is that we will not provide you dollars to support or to market your organization but we will provide support for you to market the program. Oh, okay. So if you have an organization and you wanna send out, um, a, you do a YouTube page or, or just do marketing you know, flyers on your organization, no, we won't support that portion. But if you wanna send out flyers to the community saying, I have an educational program where I'm offering tutoring services and you want to do it for the program, yes, we will support that. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Next. Uh, Jacqueline Perkins from Great Communities Now. Hi, Jacqueline. Hello. Hi, Jacqueline. You're on. We hear you. So thank you so much. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I was just wondering, is it possible to get these lovely slides that you're um, speaking to? Yes, we will make our slides available on our online page. If you go to the City of Detroit, 
Housing and Revitalization Department. Um, I believe it's Mandy, can you help me out? Um, if you go to the HRC section webpage. that's called for nonprofits and community development, um, yes. click on that link and it'll bring you to um, the, the Opportunity Fund uh, website. Okay, thank you. And I have one additional question. If you're not a 501c3, but you work with, uh, we have a community organization and we work with fiduciaries, mm -hmm. is that okay? Yes, that is okay. Just keep in mind that the fiduciary is the applicant. Right, and has to meet all that criteria. It has to meet all the criteria as well. So you will be submitting information for your program and for the fiduciary as well. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Next. John? Yeah, my question is, um, will we receive some sort of email confirmation that we've attended this meeting? Um, I'm not sure, but if, you put, down the, the, if you put down the date, on the application that you attended, then we will have that information. And I believe we have a listing of everyone who attended based on the um, event right that was submitted. Yep, so you're good. Anyone else, Mandy? Yep, uh, Letitia Robinson. Hi, Letitia, how are you? Hello. Okay, can you hear me? We hear you great. Okay, um, so my question is, um, if you are a nonprofit who is from actually out of state, you have the 501c3, but this is your first time, w this would be your first year um, applying for the Michigan um, state uh, nonprofit classification, are you still allowed to apply or should you wait to the next year? So, uh, you're from out of state. This is, um, do you operate a program in the city of Detroit? Um, this will be our first year starting in the city of Detroit. So no. Okay. Because you haven't been operating for a year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Krista Dover. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you yeah. great. Hi, thank you. I just had a quick question. Um, I am writing for SDBA, and um, sometimes we'd like to, uh, for the arts program, Compaz, and sometimes we'd like to purchase some audio equipment for the youth to be able to use microphones and stuff. So would equipment for the program be allowable? Um, yes, it is allowable, as long as it's um, reasonable and customary. So what does that mean? That means that um, as long as what you're purchasing is for the program and it's under a certain amount, then yes, we could, but that would be based on your individual program. I would suggest that if that is the case, you get in touch with your current program manager to have that conversation with them. But yes, as long as you're purchasing equipment specifically for the program and it's under a certain amount of money and you procured that those um, material or those uh, that equipment properly, it is uh, approvable. But we have to just, you need to talk to your program manager before you purchase it, not after, before. <laughs> we want to make sure that it's eligible, right? So. Very, very good, thank you. You're welcome. Mandy, Jeff we're going to do two more, okay? Go ahead. Hey, it's Jeff. Um, in terms of uh, promoting the program, um, I just want to make sure we're, we're still just going to talk to our, our program manager. So Mandy, if we had any communications or stuff like that, that we wanted to um, you know, put the uh, HRD or city's logo on some, uh, some information reports about the program, we would just, I'd still contact Mandy, right? Just want to double Correct. check. Correct. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Tamara. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeff. And, I want to get uh, two more because we need to get moving. Go ahead. Vanessa Bias. Hi, Vanessa. Hello. How are you? I'm great, thank you, and appreciate all your information. Yes. Uh, listening to you, I find that I don't qualify because we're only one year, we're not, uh, one year old, so I'll have to wait till next year. Mm -hmm. However, 
I want to make sure that we even qualify. Um, actually, we are Freedom Run Dog Park. Uh, we take blighted areas where there's a need for um, dog parks in that area so that they won't be running the street. People have a place to go and communally uh, get together and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Just, that's just a quick highlight. Mm -hmm. And I know for sure that we will be serving the community no matter where we go. And yeah. I just want to know, is that something that we even qualify so that I won't be wasting your time doing going through that? Because I'm going It doesn't to sound through. like it because it doesn't fit in any of our categories. It doesn't it doesn't fit in safety, it doesn't fit in education, it doesn't fit in senior. So I would I would definitely look at our, our program areas, our five priority areas and uh, and determine based on those areas if it fits based on what you're telling me right now it mm -hmm. doesn't but what i would if you want to um send me an email later and you can give me a little bit more detail i'm okay. open to that All okay right. uh, even if we just squeeze in that we're educating the community through the laws of how to uh, take care of pets properly that's not education that's not, okay. it doesn't fit within our educational it's, that doesn't fit within our educational scope Okay. That, now, you, once I, get, I, I, you know, I hear what you're doing, and it's it's wonderful. You're mm -hmm. squeezing it in, but it, it doesn't fit. <laughs> That's okay. I'll work with it. I'll I'll get your email address and get with yeah. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. We're here to help. We love our furry creatures too. <laughs> They're just not part of the program. Go ahead, Mandy. One more, and then we need we need to get get going. Vivian Palmer. You said Dan Palmer? Vivian. Vivian. Hi, Vivian. Doesn't like you brought her in yet. Oh, there she is. On mute. Hi. Hi, um, hi how are you? I'm um, well. So I, my question is, uh, Michigan is one of the states that acknowledges the L3C which is a low um, income social impact. So it's a cross between a um, LLC and a nonprofit. Will, will the city ever um, include those types of structures in these grant opportunities? Um, yeah. I would love to be able to answer your question, but unfortunately I can't. I think that's probably a question that, um, first of all, number one, we have to follow HUD even if the city allowed it, we have to follow HUD regulation. And I'm not okay. certain that HUD regulation, that would be included from a HUD regulation point of view. So that's something that we would have to explore. Um, as far as for the city, that's something that the um, city council would have to give approval for. Um, but again, that's something we would have to look into. As of right now, I haven't read anything in the HUD guidelines that allows us to do that. Right now, it just states 501c3. You have to be a 501c3 organization. So that's something we would have to explore, Vivian. Okay. I just asked because I know that there, um, we have um, applied for other federal grants, mm -hmm. and we were able to acquiesce an opportunity under those particular grants. Yeah. Um, we, we provide training and education services. So I've not seen any of the city grants that have been inclusive of that, with Michigan being yeah. one of the you know, the cities that allow for those types of, um, yeah. you know, organizational structures. I, I wish I could give you more information. Um, we pretty, we, we try to, we know we don't try, we do stick to our HUD regulation. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not certain, again, I, I go straight to the HUD regulation first. And even if the city allowed it, if HUD doesn't allow it, we can't do it. Each HUD program is different in their requirements. And some HUD programs, uh, for example, there's a home program that has different regulations than, than what we do. ESG and um, our homelessness program might have some different regulations. So while they, the program that you apply for did allow for your program under that regulation for the public service <laughs> regulation, it may not. So let's check into that, but as of right now, I have to be honest and say, I really just don't know. We do, that's something we'll have to explore. Okay, thank you. But I will say that if you're providing programs that fit within our priority, 
and you don't have the 501c designation, you can always partner with a fiduciary that does. Yes, that's what we that's what we've done on some grants, but we were trying yeah. to bring some stability to our organization or bring it mm -hmm. into the forefront. So okay. and and be independent on you know on the applications, but yeah, okay. So it can how how do I follow up with you to see if this this question is going to be represented in some other forum for consideration? I, I think you. I think the um, why don't we connect offline? And okay. my uh, phone number, I think, and email address is at the end of this. It's a part of uh, this PowerPoint presentation at the very end, I believe. I'm not sure. No, okay. I don't but think it I is, can but we can it provide in. it. We can provide it to you, okay? Okay. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, I'm going to cut off the questions after that. Uh, if you have any further questions, please save them to the end, and I will be sure to get to them. And I'm going to turn it over to Gordon, who's going to talk about our public service application review in detail. So you want to pay attention to this portion because we actually have questions that are representative on the application that you will need to answer. And, and Gordon's going to provide you with the information you need to provide the best possible question to that answer. Excuse me, best possible okay. answer to the question. So Gordon, you can take it from here. Thank you. Uh, so good morning. Uh, as you mentioned, I'll review, first I'll review the application funding process and then I'll go over the actual application itself. So to start, um, the NOF process has is a three part, a three phase process where uh, it begins with the hosting of the RFP and best practice uh, workshop, which is the phase we're currently in now. And then it also goes into the the release and submittal of the application, which um, the application itself will be available October 9th. Um, there was initially going to be available on the 28th, uh, but I do want to make that uh, to note that the application will be released on September 9th. I believe I said October the 1st, <clears throat> the first time, excuse me. So yes, the application will be available September 9th and it will close on October 9th. Uh, the second phase is the pre, uh, recommendations that will be presented to the mayor and city council. Uh, the mayor and city council will approve or uh, suggest changes to our recommendation and that city, city council will award the funding. And then a the third process, which is the implement, implementation process. And that is the, um, the actual running of the program and the HR, HRD oversight and monitoring of that particular uh, activity. Um, the application uh, consensus review team. So applications are reviewed by a team of four individuals from four different departments. Uh, those departments include the HRD, of course, the Office of Contract and Procurement, Office of Development and Grant, and the City Planning Commission. So it's not just the Housing and Revitalization Department reviewing your application. There are three other departments that reviews your application. The application itself is broken into four sections. Um, it's, the scoring is evaluated on a five point scale where a multiplier would be used one, 1 1.5 or two to compute the total score. Uh, the, the sections include organizational information, which I'll, uh, after this, I'll go over each individual section, do an overview. Uh, the organizational information is worth up to 25 points. The project description section is wor are worth up to 35 points. Activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts is worth 20 points, and the budget itself is worth 10 points. If you are a current subrecipient, I believe Tamara mentioned this earlier, if you are a current subrecipient, sub uh, you currently have a 1920 or you have an 1819 contract with us, or uh, you will be evaluated based on your contractual compliance. If you um, if you fulfill any monitoring issues, if you haven't fulfilled any monitoring issues, or if you've been late on submitting your monthly reimbursement request, you can receive up to a 10 point deduction in your application. Um, as I mentioned before, the, that, that group of four individuals, the consensus review team, we use this scoring criteria grid. And as I mentioned before, uh, it's used on that five, or that 
five point multiplier. And as you can see, there's multiple sections. So we try to, it's try to be a consistent um, across all consist, consistent review teams. Uh, so here I have a list of uh, important things that makes a strong application. So a uh, strong application or a strong, you must have strong capacity to implement the program and have a proven track record of program success. So in the application itself, it asks about the organizational information um, and your list of accomplishments. A proven design that capitalizes on the successful implementation and program. The program does not have a high administrative cost. So we do require that the, uh, the budget itself has uh, less than a 12% administrative cost. The applicant has a partnerships with the community in which they are working with. Um, for our application, we require that um, the applicant provide at least three uh, letters of support from community organizations. Uh, the organization has a capacity to comply with the program rules and guidelines. Uh, a lot of those guidelines and regulations uh, were mentioned by Tamara. A clearly defined scope of work and staff roles. Uh, program goals are realistic and achievable. Uh, the budget, very important, the scope of work and the budget are aligned. Um, it's uh, very important that you're not requesting uh, or you're telling us one thing in regards to the scope of work, what you're going to, what your activity is going to be, and then your budget does not uh, align with that that request. A clear, clearly defined success uh, and performance standards, metrics, outputs, and outcomes. Um, I'll go over that in detail uh, later. Program maximizing positive impact in the community and it. It serves and continues to expand and grow over time. So for those organizations that we've mentioned that currently have a contract with us and you're applying for this 20, uh, 21, 22, you have to show that quantifiable increase in the uh, services that you're providing. Uh, the program addresses community needs. Uh, the program is either a new program or expanding its services. There is a quantifiable increase, as I mentioned and the services that are delivered in the past 12 months prior. A clearly defined sustainability plan. Uh, this has been something that we've been uh, discussing and preaching um, over the past two, two years. And this particular year has made it a, a, I guess, I don't know how to articulate, but it's very important now that you can see through the pandemic, uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic that we have organizations that have not been able to continue on because of loss of funding or have to uh, stop activity because of um, the pandemic itself. Uh, I will describe a, or go through a sustainability plan or example a little later. There's a clear return on investment and organization is leveraging resources to help sustain, enhance and maximize that program. Respond application, you must respond to all questions. Um, any question that's left blank is automatic zero. Uh, typically we have one particular question. I believe it's the first question of the application, which people tend to uh, leave blank or they may have attached a brochure, but the question itself asks you to, in the section below, to uh, provide the answer and in addition, you can add a brochure. So that's typically, and that's worth up to 10 points. And a lot of time organizations don't answer that question. Martin, can I just add one thing? Yes. So for those applicants that love to put C question number five for question number six, that's not answering the question. So don't do that. <laughs> that is all. <laughs> yes, please don't do that. Um, as Tamara mentioned earlier, meet all threshold requirements. As I mentioned, um, automatic zero for any uh, question left blank. Allow yourself enough time to re review your application before submitting and name all your attachments. So we have a, uh, a guide, uh, uh, 
is I'm blanking on what it's called, a uh, naming convention for your attachments. So please name all your attachments for our benefit and your benefit, because when you're reviewing your application before submitting it, if you haven't labeled all of your attachments, you may assume that something is there that may not be there. And therefore, if, if it's a required document or that's something that is supposed to meet threshold requirements, you will not be considered for a grant because you didn't meet threshold. Or if it's a document that you, you thought you may have attached but was not attached, it could greatly impact your, greatly impact your, your score. So if you're not providing uh, uh, I don't know financial information that can greatly impact your score. Uh, so before I continue, I want to give a second to take any questions, maybe five, actually five questions. Um, if we have any questions available, I don't think I see any. We have one question. Um, okay. Elizabeth Fritz Cottle. Hi there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Great. I actually had two questions. Um, the first is for current sub -grant grantees who have just received like and finalized the contract with the city. Um, will the reviewers be giving them uh, some margin of forgiveness if there's been no programming actually conducted with that funding yet. Yes, because your contract would not actually begin until the beginning of 2021. So during the review, which takes place um, in October, November, uh, November, December, we're, we'll be submitting our recommendations around November, I um, mean, excuse me, December. So therefore your, your actual grant or your, your term of service has not begun yet, so yes. Okay, great. And then my second question is, considering that many of the programs that people are probably applying for happen in person, and the pandemic has curtailed a lot of that activity. How will the reviewers take that environment into consideration when reviewing the program outcomes? Uh, so one of the actual questions in the program, I mean, in the application itself, is how do you, uh, what, in what ways do you administer your program in an innovative way? I believe that's how it's worded. So if you describe how your program is, uh, it may be, it may be administered vir virtually, then that's something, it's a, it's a, it's a question and application for you to provide that information. And also, I mean, the, everyone during the review, everything will be taken in consideration in regards to, uh, the pandemic. But in addition to this past year, uh, you should have, uh, I don't know, uh, just program, uh, outcomes and, and, and metrics and things like that from previous years, unless you've only pro been uh, providing your service for a year, you can provide more information from years prior. Yeah, and, and I can add to that too. Uh, we understand that the pandemic kind of turned everything upside down on, it, on its head, but we also expect that if you are running a program, then you should have been able to pivot some kind of way. That pivot might be mean that if you were doing in person that you um, transition to a webinar based or a zoom based or that you come up with some other innovative or practical way to run your program. So we're looking for you to tell us what you did actually and to tell us how you've been able to alter your program to continue to provide the services that you were providing before, but in an innovative way so that the people who are benefiting from your program can continue to benefit from it. So we're, we're, we're excited about uh, reading how that's going to happen. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, and we sure. have um, Jacqueline Perkins. Hi, I, uh, this is Jackie Perkins again. I just had a, another question. Is there a time limit on how these funds are used? if you were to receive the grant? Yes, so our funding periods are usually 12 months exactly. So it typically starts, uh, the activity will start at the beginning of the year, January 1, um, and the funding period would end December 31st. It also depends on the actual programming. So if you, if you communicate with uh, the person who submits your award letter that 
you would like to adjust it, you that's possible, but it will still be a 12 month period. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Was that all the questions we had, Amanda? Yep. Okay. Up oh, there's one. Oh, I guess. Yep, one popped up. Uh, Cassandra Pack. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. I apologize. My question, I'll make it quick. I'm in the mountains, so I've been dropping in and out on the call. I just need to add to contact information so I can do offline questioning because I missed most of the presentation going in and out in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Is there a contact? I don't know how to get it. I heard something about a hit. It will be on the end of a slide, and then my call dropped. Yeah. So the presentation itself will be, it's being recorded, so it will be provided. And also we have another session that is scheduled for September 10th um, via Zoom also. So if, you, if you're not getting all the information today, you'll be able to uh, I don't know, join that particular one, but also the slides and everything will be provided. And also, um, as far as the email, I can give you my email. Um, I don't know if you want to, want me to give it to you now or wait to the end. Yes, I actually pulled over in Kentucky just to listen to the balance of the um, conference call. I'm sorry, you so said you pulled over to listen to? Yes, this meeting. Yes, sir. Uh, so my email is Pearson, P-E-A-R-S-O-N-G at DetroitMI.gov. And Mr. Pearson, can you slow down just a tad and do that one more time for me? Pearson, P E A. R S O N. My first initial G as in go at Detroit M I dot gov. Yeah, Detroit spelled out, sir? Yes. Thank you. Was all the questions that was all the questions there? Yep. You go ahead and mute. Okay, so I will begin with the organization section. As I mentioned, uh, this is the first section of our uh, application, and I will just give a brief a brief overview of some of the questions and the expectations for each section. So, organizational information. One second, sorry, I have to close out this. So uh, the organizational information, which I believe this is the first question that I mentioned earlier, says briefly describe your organization and the unique experiences and qualifications that make your organization the most appropriate to provide these proposed services. Uh, so that is a that's where you would provide that question in that particular section and then also provide if if you have a, a brochure. But the purpose of providing information in this section is to provide your your proof of accomplishment, wh whether it's uh, data to back up your plans of your accomplishment or just uh, information. Also, the, in the within the organizational section, you need to describe who are you? you? What is your organization? Who do you serve? The population you serve? Uh, who are your board members? Um, there's a section within the application where you have to just uh, list out all the board members. And as Tamara mentioned, you have to at least have at least five board members. Uh, what are your hours of operation? Uh, whether that program is seasonal or are year round, you have to provide a, uh, the, your hours of operation. Does your program or organization use volunteers and a number of staff? Uh, you will have to provide a staffing plan for your organization uh, for your and also within the staffing plan, your staffing your list of staff or personnel must match on your budget. Project description. In your project description, please provide a detail of the proposed project, not your organization, but the project itself. 
include how it will be implemented and the plan for it to continue the operation. Um, as you can see, it says no, that is a one page maximum. We give that amount of space on there. Please don't try to fit uh, three pages worth of information on one page. We will prefer to be able to read the information you're providing. So please provide it at a 12 point font. Uh, please be prepared to respond to the following questions. Uh, what is your, what is the objective of your program? The reason for requesting funding for the program? Uh, specific services you're providing or what is the specific, specific service you're providing? Uh, when and how will these services be provided? Uh, the number of participants that fall in the low to moderate income range. This is very important. Um, you must service a low to moderate income uh, individual or area. Uh, this information within the application itself, but also once if you're awarded, you have to track this information on a monthly basis. Uh, describe how the activity will be implemented, operated, and administered. Uh, what and how many workers by job title will a plan supervise and monitor so in addition to providing the list of um, personnel and their qualifications, I forgot to mention earlier, within that staffing plan that you must provide resumes for all staff that will be working on the program, um, but also um, within the application itself, you would need to provide job, uh, job title or job description for each person working on that particular project. Um, if volunteers are used, how many will be how many will be used and what will they be doing? Are there any other organization providing similar services? You have to describe other organizations within your program area that provide similar service. So if you're a recreation program, please name other rec programs providing that similar service. Um, a lot of times we have individuals that say that no one else is providing a service because that particular organization believes that or believes or that program is unique to them because it might have a, a a section of it that is very unique but we need you to highlight the other organization that shows the uh that you've collaborated with other organ other organizations that or that you're just aware of other organizations providing that similar service and as i mentioned earlier where in your program can you demonstrate innovation what what sets your organization apart from other organizations providing that similar service so what are the reasons for requesting your cdbg nof funding activity is it to continue existing nof funding or funded public service project uh, to prevent reduction of existing services due to uh, increased cost to expand and add to existing services, uh, levels to meet uh, unmet demand or need. Uh, current subrecipients, what is your primary reason for requesting continued support? Is it because you have a wait list of clients or students that you want to be able to serve? Is it the increased demand of individuals that you are serving? So the sustainability, uh, we we request that you submit a sustainability plan and i'll provide a, a example of that sustainability plan but as far as sustainability uh what are the steps your organization is taking to move your service population to self-sufficiency how do you plan to sustain the program when funding ends please provide a sustainability plan as i mentioned and what are specific community unmet need what specific community unmet need is being addressed through your program? So here's an example of a, a sustainability action plan. And as you can see, it is broken down by a timeline and the actions taken in the method and plan component. So as you can see, uh, for the winter, uh, they plan to uh, communicate, communication of program and funding goals for the year to staff and the board. And as you can see, it says that they're meeting with staff to discuss uh, 
meeting with staff and board to discuss the annual program and funding goals and activities, providing funding ca uh, fundraising calendar with a grant due due dates and campaigns listed. Uh, for a sustainability plan, in the past we've received individuals that stand that for sustainability they're they're going to do annual bake sales or um, as a Tamara loves to say that you're going to cook uh, dinners and sell sell dinners. Uh, that is not a sustainability plan. While it may be a, a good fundraiser, it's not it's not good for sustainability of the program itself. Uh, community support, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you're required to uh, provide at least three uh, three letters of community support. Uh, the community support describes the net, describe your network or networks, planning tables, partnerships, or working groups you are involved in, and that enhance your ability to deliver services. Uh, what kind of community support do you receive, including volunteer or in kind support? Uh, describe the actions undertaken in conjunction with other community organizations to deliver to deliver these services for which their funding is being sought. Uh, I saw one question pop up. Is that question still there, Mandy? Yep. Okay. Uh, Donna. Donna, did you still have a question? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. I'm Donna Coulter with Higher Ground Abodes, and I'm wondering if there is a federal distinction um, in this case between low to moderate income versus those who are very to extremely low income. Are they inclusive in the service group for this grant? Yes. So as long we do provide I believe in the application, but or it can be pulled up from uh, um, HUD itself. But annual, on an annual basis, they release uh, a set of um, uh, what is it called? Just uh, low to moderate income uh, levels for individuals. But yes, if you're extremely low, that you fit within the low, the low to moderate income area. If if that's what you're asking, correct? That's exactly what I'm asking. Okay. Yes, thank you. Hey, we got a couple more that popped up. Tyrone Anderson. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. I was just curious if there is uh, some sort of repository or if there's access to uh, some prior uh, successful applications. Uh, so actually Mandy pro provides a list on our NOF webpage. We have a list of prior um, uh, organizations that have been recommended for funding and the services that they provide. That information is available on our website. Um, I'm not sure. Go ahead. I was just saying it's not the actual application. It's no. just a summary of services provided. So it's not an actual successful application that you can review. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fair enough. Okay. Then we have one more question. Jacqueline Perkins. Hello. Yes. Hello. Oh, hi, it's Jacqueline or Jackie again. Um, so we're a community organization that does uh, housing and community uh, revitalization. So are those kind of grants, just in a general sense, are those kinds of things funded for this program typically? Uh, depends on what type of program are you referring to. You could be a, are you referring to that your organization is a CHOTO or, and you're providing, if you're providing a public service, then what, what, what is that particular pu public service you're providing? Uh, trying to enhance our community. So we just received 
a pretty nice sizable grant through Kresge and we're doing some renovation of our business corridor and we're trying to get uh, new businesses uh, in the community. So we want to do like open houses and things like that to kind of showcase um, some of the businesses with the anticipation we'd like to hopefully bring jobs to the community and just uh, renovate. We're creating a community center. So are those kinds of things funded through this or do they have to be, because I keep hearing the word program, like it's like people come, they do something in a program, then they go home. Then they come back yeah. again. So. so it doesn't sound like that, the things you've mentioned, uh, it sounds more like uh, economic development, I believe. Um, I, I've heard you say like uh, you're enhancing the land, I mean, enhancing the corridor, different things like that. That's uh, improvement or beautification or capital improvement. It, it doesn't sound like those things will fall in the public service program. It does not? So no, it doesn't sound like to me. I mean, anyone anyone else on my team that could uh, interject if they do. Yeah, I, it needs to be. I mean, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning on where we want to start because we got to have a platform before we can move into other things. But we're also creating a community center. So this grant sounds pretty much like it's like more about programming it is doing things with people. Yeah, I would say that based on the little bit that you shared with us, it is not um, a, a funding opportunity. This is not something that you would want to go after. Uh, this grant is specifically for projects and programs that are serving the citizens of Detroit. What you're describing to me is more um, development related. And our dollars can't go toward any development related projects. So if you're doing construction, if you're doing renovation, um, if it doesn't fit within the five priority areas that we've named, it is not uh, eligible for this program. So would that be, and not to keep uh, going on with this, the Lin Lindsay Wallace that you mentioned earlier? Lindsay, her program is public facility rehab. And what that means is that they're doing rehab on, or on um, buildings that house a public service activity that serves the citizens of Detroit. So while she's doing that work, it wouldn't be again for residential property. It wouldn't be if, if the, the community center that you're thinking that you're trying to open, but yeah. you haven't opened yet, will provide services and programs for the people in your community once it opens, that might be a project that she can do. But as of right now, she can't give you money in my, from my for rehab to do it from a rehab perspective, no. And her dollars can only go towards renovating the rooms that, she, that you're operating out of, not the entire organization. So okay, I, would, okay. I would suggest that you reach out to her yes. in the city of Detroit, and she could probably give you more um, information on her program. Okay, thank you so much. That's perfect. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. We got one more question that popped up. Cassandra Pack. Cassandra? Thanks. I'm like you're breaking up. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Cassandra. So why don't you hold on to that? Yeah. You're you're breaking up. Why don't you hold on to that question until the till the end, and then we can address it then. Okay. Uh, am I good to move forward? Yes, forward. Okay. So, um, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. For that particular section of the application. So, to give you a definition of each, uh, outputs are the products of the program activity or result of pro program processes. So, what are your deliverables? For example, the number of classes taught, the number of counseling sessions, or the number of people served. Those are the outputs. Uh, impact assess the change that can be 
contributed to the particular intervention, such as such as a program or policy. Uh, you have a short-term impact, uh, intermediate impact, and long-term impact. As you can see, short-term would fall within that that one year of that particular uh, activity uh, or that program. Uh, the intermediate is that two years, and the long term is three to five years or even more. Uh, the outcomes are the changes in the program participants. Uh, they can be identified by asking, how will the program participants change as a result of their participation in your program? Organizations must clearly state the method methodology used to measure outcomes, i.e. survey, client interviews, pre and post test. Um, we have a lot of organizations that use the pre and post test, especially I'm excuse me, education program as a raw, uh, result of the client self-reporting or excuse me, client self-reporting. So that it could be verbal or uh, via uh, email. This is an example uh, from the actual application in which you would list the outputs and activities. As you can see, for example, here, you have the uh, number of persons served monthly is uh, 35. The number of persons served, uh, a number of unduplicated persons served annually is 400. You have the days that a service provided, the time of the service provided, uh, personnel implementing that particular activity and the title, the benefits to the particular participant, whereas the list of outcomes, they develop skills and sports and other recreational activities, engaged, engaged youth and constructive, supervised play, provides no cost care for children while parents are working. So that's an example from, so if the proposed activity is already in existence, what were its outputs from the most recent completed fiscal year? Uh, what are, the outputs of, for the proposed activity for the current fiscal year. Uh, what are the proposed tools? What are, excuse me, what processes and tools are in place uh, to measure the program outcomes? So for the first two, uh, we, it's important to remember that you're, you're providing the output from previous years. Uh, maybe that could be the current year that you're providing that service and or previous years, and also the proposed, the whether you're, pro, you're proposing that you're gonna increase uh, the number of service uh, people served by uh, 50 or more, you just have to provide that proposed amount. Uh, what kind of lasting benefit does the organization hope to provide to clients through this particular service? Uh, if it's an education program, do they help to provide to uh, help a client to uh, gain their GED? Uh, for example, how successful was your program in achieving this proposed outcome? And what outcome indicators were used to determine those results? I think another is a standard of measurement. So very important, it depending on what your activity is. Um, uh, for example, if you are providing a uh, education program uh, for, I don't know, a G, is a GED program or and you're using a specific program, um, a program that's approved by the state or provide or approved by the GED board, that is important to highlight those type of uh, standard of measurements that you'll be using to uh, show how successful you were in achieving those proposed outcomes. Another section in the application itself is uh, it's building information. So if you own your building, uh, does your building does your building use and comply with zoning regulations? Uh, is your facility ADA compliant? If no, what are you doing to improve that? Are you are your property taxes current? Uh, does the building comply with the building and fire code regulations? These are uh, fire. Uh, fire, building a fire code and permits and things like that will be asked to be provided. Has this building been inspected by the fire marshal? Does your sponsor have a sufficient income to operate and maintain the site? So that, that would believe if that's if you're operating within another individual's um, facility. 
Uh, I just saw a question pop up. Vivian Palmer. You're muted. I don't know if you know. Oh, there you go. Question I was trying to put my phone on the charger, so I might have hit the raise my hand. Okay. But... Uh, so the budget section. Uh, budget is very important. It's worth 20, 20 points that we mentioned. Uh, the budget. For the budget, you have to ask questions or be prepared to ask questions such as who is responsible for maintaining the organization's uh, financial records? What was the amount of your organization's total budget for the most recent fiscal year? Uh, when was your most recent audit? As you know, the audit is required. Describe your financial management system, whether you, you outsource your financial management through uh, an accounting uh, firm or you use a particular account, um, financial management system or software. That's the information you provide. If you are a current subrecipient, have you submitted a timely down, uh, drawdown packet? That's your monthly uh, reimbursement request, which is due by the 15th of every month. Are your taxes and water bills current? Uh, this here is an example of a budget which you have to complete for um, the application. So um, poor, important things to recognize on this budget is the amount of under, other funding sources for that pr proposed activity. So um, if this organization or this activity you're, you're requesting um, is 100% CDBG funded, and you, it could possibly impact your score. Um, we'd like to see that you've do you leverage other funding or you have other funding sources for that particular activity? Uh, the personnel, personnel should be broken out. The budget for the personnel should be broken out by position. Uh, so in the personnel section, you have to have each line item has to have, have a separate budget. The operating expense as an operating expense, such as uh, materials would be an uh, example of operating expense to run that program and specific Program expense uh, is clear that it has to be specific to that program, which ex excludes personnel. Uh, also, we're looking for, as I mentioned, the strength of finances, which include uh, adequate cash on hand, uh, strength of other funding sources, as I mentioned, demonstrated acceptable financial management system. Uh, we are looking to see that the budget is accurate, responsible, and necessary and related to the proposed uh, activity. I think earlier Tamara mentioned that if you're requesting uh, something that is uh, unreasonable, or I believe that's the term we use, reasonableness, um, that you accurately, accurately describe and justify each proposed budget line item. Um, we have it, you have to describe or provide a justification for each line item in your budget. You actually have to write that out. And also what percentage of the budget will be expended on administrative expense? Your administrative expense cannot exceed uh, 12 percent. Mm -mm. So for contractual compliance, uh, as we mentioned previously, this is for existing public service subrecipients only. Uh, if you are if you are current subrecipient have you submitted timely and completed CDBG and OF monthly reimbursement? Uh, we, we will be able to, there is a question to ask you this. And if you answer yes, uh, and you have not been, we can, we will know exactly if you submitted your monthly reimbursement. Uh, so you can receive, if you have not, you can receive a deduction. As a current subrecipient, do you have any outstanding monitoring issues so if your um, if your project manager has requested documentation um, following that monitoring, if you have not been you have been unresponsive, or you have just have not submitted within the within the timeline that was requested, you can receive a deduction for that. Are you, oh, well, there it is. 
are you responsive to the city of Detroit request for a document? That's regardless if it's from HRD or any other uh, department within the city of Detroit. As a sub recipient, have you, uh, have you been compliant in meeting program requirements? Have you attended our quarterly sub recipient training and technical assistance workshops? That's another thing that you can be, uh, you'll be graded on or scored on, excuse me. So before I go into the new uh, software, do we have any, we don't have any questions, I don't think. We've got one. Okay. Lawrence? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I had a question about the budget. Um, would a narrative help at all, or do you just want the uh, applicants to simply answer the questions? No, so there, in, re in regards to your, uh, your budget, uh, there are questions in the previous sections that were kind of, you're providing the narrative for that particular uh, budget line item, I believe, if I'm answering correctly, or if yeah. I'm understanding correctly. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay, I get that. And then two, um, do you have to pay for an audit? Or I thought I heard earlier that a cash flow um, uh, budget would, would suffice or, you know, as long as that's explained in the narrative. It, am I getting that right? or? Not? So I believe you're referring to the threshold requirements. I believe it is either or. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we would prefer we would prefer both, mm -hmm. uh, but I believe that particular threshold requirement is either or. Okay, but we that, but I'll go ahead, sir. No, I would just say last question: Is it a compilation, or do you need a full blown CPA uh, oversaw audit? Um, I can't. I was I was going to say I can't, but I, I believe it is a full blown uh, complete audit from CPA. Wow. All right, thank you. And we had another question pop up. Um, John? Let, me, let me go back to that one. That's only if you have one. We're not asking you to go get one. If you have one already, yes. If mm -hmm. you don't have one, then you can provide the other documentation in, it, in exchange for that. Okay, thank you. Um, John, you had a question? Um, when referring to the uh, current suppliers or uh, sub-recipients, um, are you talking about CDBG specifically or if you're a supplier for any um, city program? And then is that current sub-recipient or, um, you know, sub-recipient in the past and will be in the future? Or is that for any funds currently being received? Uh, so we, when we're referring to sub recipient, we are referring to sub. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Where are you done? Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Oh, uh, so when we're referring to sub recipient, we are referring to a public service sub recipient. So we can only uh, we can only we we're only monitoring our public service sub recipient, uh, which which is what this application is for. So those that's in regards to that. And your other question, I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the second part of your question? Well, that, that basically answers it. The, the other question that I have is about the audit. So a 2018 audit would be sufficient then if COVID-19 has prevented the 2019 from happening uh, prior to the submission deadline? Um, I believe so. I mean, I would I would, um, defer to Tamara yes. or Carrie. Yes. Yes. I believe okay. a 2018 would, I think uh, audits normally happen every two years. So if the, your last one was in 2018, then yeah. I, would, I would suggest that in the application, you indicate that you are scheduled to have an audit if you are, when, and give us feedback as to why the, your most recent audit hasn't taken place. But you can still provide the other documentation in place of that audit if you don't have it. Okay, I'll move forward. So um, for the upcoming application, they actually is currently live. So if organization has applied for uh, homeless solution, they're familiar, but 
we have a new bid system or a bid software. Uh, previously, we've used uh, bid sync, uh, but this year we will be using our Oracle uh, advanced procurement system. If you are a current subrecipient, then you are uh, currently using that software for the supplier or to upload your invoices and to be paid. But for this, for this particular application cycle, we will be using it for the bidding. Uh, for those organizations that have not, or before I move forward, uh, so we have, we previously had a, a Oracle training uh, for individuals who are new to Oracle or currently using Oracle for different purposes. We have had a training and we have another training coming up. It will be, it will actually take place during our next RFP workshop, which is scheduled for September 10th. Um, that Oracle training will be provided by the Office of Contracts and Procurement. So they will walk through how do you register for the organization? I mean, I'm sorry, register for uh, Oracle and also how do you, they will kind of walk through the app application itself. So please, if you have not, um, please, 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 if you are not familiar or just even if, even if you are, please register for the next RFP workshop uh, so you can receive that training uh, for the Oracle system. But just for the sake of time, um, as I mentioned, our upcoming uh, or the application open, it opens September 9th uh, to register. This is how you register for supplier pool. Uh, you would visit the, our City of Detroit website. Um, and I'm kind of following through the URL address. So you're going to go to department. You're going to go to the Office of Chief Finance, Financial Office, uh, OCFO division and go to our uh, contract and procurement department. So I always, when I'm looking for this page, I always Google City Detroit uh, Office and Contract and Procurement or City Detroit Supplier Portal Information. So it will take you to this, this site you see here, which is a screenshot. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, you will see this uh, box here where it says new supplier registration. As a, it is a hyperlink, so if you click that, it will take you to the page to register uh, for supplier portal. Um, it is imperative that you will, you do this immediately prior to the application being released, so you have an opportunity to uh, get the get your organization information inputted, and also so you can have an opportunity to, um, I guess, feel your way around the system prior to the actual training, uh, but. As you can see here, I provided the resource or contact information for Supplier Portal, and you can reach out to them if you have any questions. But as I mentioned, we have a training uh, coming up during the second RFP workshop, which will be on September 10th. Um, you can visit. Um, well, most of you should have received the the link to register for that workshop, along with this one. Uh, so you, you should be familiar with that, but also that information to register. Um, to or how to register is on our uh, NOF workshop page. Um, and as, as I mentioned, the workshop materials before, workshop materials will be available on um, uh, City Detroit HRD page. And if necessary, I can send them out via Eventbrite for all those individuals that registered for this workshop. And as I mentioned before, um, application will be submitted through Oracle, and they will also they'll be available to begin applying on September 9th. And the application closes, I believe, which is I believe that's a Friday, October 9th, at 4 p.m. So please do not wait until 3:49, 3:59 to submit your application. Please submit it uh, early enough that you have enough time to review and get your application in. Because once it's once four o'clock happens, you cannot submit it after four o'clock. You have to submit it prior to that deadline. Um, if also, so that will be the end of that presentation. Do we have any additional questions?